Welcome to Mercy Medical Center's live webinar. Today we will be discussing the misuse of prescription drugs. Joining us is Sean Stepp, Program Coordinator at Mercy Sedlicek Treatment Center. After her discussion, she will take questions from our audience. To submit your questions any time during the discussion, go to the window in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and type in your question. If you don't see the screen, click on the orange box with the white arrow. Your questions will be confidential. Well, welcome to our webinar, Sean. Let's go ahead and get started today. Thank you very much for having me here today. I'm very excited about providing some information um, on a topic that unfortunately we're seeing more and more of. Um, pill addiction is becoming more predominant in our society. And according to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health in 2009, approximately 16 million Americans aged 12 and older had used a prescription for non-medical purposes at least once in the year prior to this um, survey happening. What causes me to pause is when I see the age 12 and what I can tell you is we're seeing younger and younger ages coming to treatment who are trying um, various drugs but in particular now the prescription drugs we're seeing a lot of. Um, the prescriptions that are being um, used typically tend to fall into three categories. One is the opioid which is um, pain medication. Stimulants, these are drugs that are used to treat conditions such as attention deficit disorder um, and we're also seeing the sedative drugs, a lot of the anti-anxiety medications such as Valium and Xanax. So first let's talk a little bit about what substance abuse is and I'm going to give you a technical definition so bear with me. Um, sub substance abuse is defined as the use of any chemical substance in a manner that might deviate from a society's acceptable medical or legal patterns. It's also the use of a chemical substance to the point where it starts to interfere with a person's health, their economic and their legal status, or their social situations or occupational functioning of the user, but it also includes others that are affected by the user's actions. Drug addiction then is defined as an irresistible compulsion used to treat a chemical substance at increasing dose and frequency despite the presence of negative impact it's beginning to have on the user's physical and emotional health and functioning in personal relationships. And I think the, the difference between substance abuse and drug addiction is that now they have the irresistible psychological compulsion to use the substance. The American Medical Society does recognize chemical dependency as a chronic brain disease in so much that it is predictable, it's chronic, it's primary, and what I mean by primary is that it's not a symptom of another underlying disorder and if it's left untreated it often results in death. While there currently unfortunately is no cure for chemical dependency the disease can be very successfully managed and if somebody doesn't seek help for their addiction it does progress. So let's take a look at some different definitions. First, let's talk about physical dependence. And this is basically where a person's body gets used to having a substance on board. It actually adapts to accommodate that substance. In doing so, many times if a person tries to stop using on their own or, or cold turkey, depending on what the substance is that they're using, it may produce withdrawal symptoms. And withdrawal from alcohol can be life-threatening due to seizures and definitely needs medically supervised detox. Psychological dependence consists of a mental compulsion or drive to use a drug to alter a person's mood. Psychological dependence, um, psychological dependence um, can be very powerful and it, this is often what leads a person back to using. 
while the body accommodates the presence of a substance, tolerance can occur. And this is where the person will need higher and higher dosing of the drug to get the same desired mood-altering effect. And this can be extremely dangerous as the amount of the drug taken is greater, so are the risks of death resulting from an actual overdose. Withdrawal are primary symptoms that occur when a substance is abruptly stopped. And people, again, who try to quit using drugs many times relapse because the withdrawal symptoms um, become too unbearable. Let me give you an example that might help illustrate what I'm talking about. Let's say patient John sought out his doctor after having a bad fall, let's say from a ladder, where he broke his ankle, thus requiring surgery to have screws attached to the bone to aid in his healing. Well, of course, John is going to have immense pain with this type of injury, and the doctor prescribes him OxyContin to treat the pain. And OxyContin is a prescription pain medication. During John's recovery, he continues to take his medication when experiencing pain. Unfortunately, John starts to notice that he isn't getting the relief he used to. And therefore, he increases the dose on his own until that stops working. And now he increases the dose again, building up his tolerance to this particular drug. This pattern continues for many months. By this time, his injury has healed for the most part, but he is still reporting pain. This is where the problem lies. Opioids can create a sense of euphoria and pleasure due to how the chemicals react to the chemical makeup of the brain. So in essence, John has learned that, and as a result, he struggles with letting go of those pleasurable moods. At this point, the psychological dependence surfaces and can go as far as deceiving John into thinking he still has actual pain due to the OxyContin's effects on his nerves. Prescription and illegal drugs are classified into schedules. And some of the examples of drugs in each schedules are as follows. Your scheduled one drugs, which have no medical use, are drugs such as heroin, LSD, or ecstasy. Scheduled II drugs have severe dependence potential and may include prescription medication, medications such as oxycodone, amphetamines, Ritalin, or morphine. Scheduled III drugs have moderate potential for dependence and may include hydrocodone, ketamine, or buprenorphine. A Schedule IV drug has limited dependence potential and may include the anti-anxiety medic medications. Scheduled V drugs have limited abuse potential and may include things like phenogren, which is often used for nausea, and pseudoephedrine, which can be used for allergies. These are just some medications that fall into the schedules, and of course there's many, many more, but I wanted to give you an example of what type of medications would fall in each category. The use of prescription drugs and illegal drugs often follow a predictable course when they are abused. In the experimentation stage with a substance, it usually occurs in social situations with peers. And many times when we hear that, we think of adolescents, but this can also be true for, for adults as well. The next stage we usually see is what's called use or misuse, and this is the use of a drug to have fun or to cope with uncomfortable feelings or situations. And somebody then will start to learn, if I take this pill and I have to go speak in front of a large audience, I notice this pill helps me calm down. Well, from now on, I'm going to make sure I'm taking that pill, and I may take two now because if one worked, two might work better. The next stage is the abuse stage. And this is where we see more regular use that starts to interfere with a person's functioning. Their attitudes start to change, relationships begin to fall apart, and they may experience health issues. 
And lastly, the addiction stage or dependence stage. Tolerance and withdrawal symptoms are now present. There's a loss of control over the use of the drug. And the person, um, in more often than not now, is in denial about the seriousness of their situation. So why is it so hard for someone to stop using a drug? When drugs are initiated, the brain is flooded with dopamine, which feels wonderful. Let's say, for instance, a person takes a hit of cocaine. The release of dopamine in the brain sears that event within the brain, which causes the brain to actually believe it is an important survival act. It's that powerful. Until the person now gets that dopamine hit or survival hit, Everything else is viewed as a threat to survival. So for a person who's addicted, the brain actually gets hijacked. When the brain kicks into the survival mode, there is a decreased activity in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is responsible for decision making and thinking. So in essence, dopamine is released and the ability to say no decreases. And this is what creates this huge dilemma for the person who simply can't stop using. So the first group of prescriptions we are seeing abused are the opioids or pain medications. These are the most commonly abused. Codeine is usually injected or swallowed and street names um, may include loads, or CODES. And again, there's many other names. I'm just giving you a couple for each of these. Morphine can be injected, swallowed, or smoked. Street names might include Miss Emma or White Stuff. Methadone is swallowed or injected. Street name could be called Fizzies. Oxycodone or Hydrocodone is chewed, swallowed, snorted, or injected and street names may include smack, footballs, or blue haven. Symptoms of pain medication use might include lethargy, drowsiness, sense of euphoria, nausea, constricted pupils, slowed breathing, unconsciousness, and death. And the risk of death greatly increases when combined with alcohol or other central nervous system depressants. Stimulants such as Adderall, Concerta, and Ritalin are prescription medications that are used to treat things such as attention deficit disorders. When these are abused, many people will crush them up and snort them. This causes euphoria, increased energy, rapid or irregular heart rhythms and can easily cause death. Depressants such as Xanax or Valium are prescribed for anxiety problems. These drugs can be very dangerous when abused and in particular when combined with alcohol which is also a depressant. Withdrawal from Xanax or Valium requires medical supervision as it also can be life-threatening. Sleep medications such as Ambien, while not as often abused as the other drugs, can also be very dangerous. There have been reports of people taking Ambien during the daytime while they're trying to go to work and function throughout their day. They're getting in their cars and they're driving and when they're pulled over They'll have no memory of driving or how they even got to where they ended up going. Dextromethorphan, or what's known as DXM, is a key ingredient that's found in over-the-counter cough syrups and cold medication. In 2010, 6.6% .6 of high school seniors took enough cough syrup to get high. And this is according to a study by National Institute on Drug Abuse. At high doses, dextromethorphan can act like PCP, which is a hallucinogen, or ketamine, and it produces dissociative 
or what's called out-of-body experiences, poisoning, and psychotic breaks. Currently, there are no medications that are FDA approved to treat stimulant addiction, such as Adderall or Concerta. The first step may be to taper the drug dose down to attempt to ease the withdrawal symptoms while the person actually begins substance abuse treatment. The following things I want to share are just some very interesting facts. Teenagers believe that prescription drugs are now easier to get than the illicit drugs. The number of teenagers in drug treatment has increased over 30 percent in the last 10 years, according to one recent study. There are about 70 million Americans who are identified as having chronic pain. The use of opiates affect the perception of an emotional response to pain and stress. And as you'll see on your screen, 10 percent of adolescents aged 12 through 17 years have used non-medical opioids. And opioid use is associated with the highest rate of drug-related overdose and mortality and often require long-term treatment. And again, it's more often times the opioid or pain medication is being abused with another substance such as um, Xanax and Valium and or alcohol. And that again increases the probability of death. Death caused by prescription drugs now exceeds those caused by cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine combi combined. More teens also abuse prescription drugs than any illicit drug, except for marijuana. So what are the dangers? This list could, could be quite a bit longer, but I'm going to just share with you some of the most um, risky things. I think the biggest one is the belief that people feel if it's prescribed to them, then it must be safe the belief that it is even prescribed to someone else and the person uses their medication. They feel it's still safe because a drug company has made this drug. The availability of the prescription drugs also has increased. And adolescents who abuse prescription medications are more likely to report use of other drugs. And then multiple studies have also shown associations between prescription drug abuse and higher rates of cigarette smoking, heavy episodic drinking, marijuana, cocaine, and many other illicit drugs. The one I skipped and I want to go back to now is a term that's called farming parties. And if you'll notice how it's spelled, it's not like a farm, but like pharmacy. And what this is, is kids will bring any medications that they can find at home and everyone dumps these pills into a large bowl that it's mixed up and they call it trail mix then everybody takes a handful of the drugs and they swallow them and wait to see what happens we've seen only a small amount of this in Cedar Rapids the bigger cities though is where a lot of um, this is being seen There is a term called outright denial, and this is where the person refuses to accept that they have a problem. It's the denial, if not addressed, that will end up killing a person. And so often times there may be warning signs that something just isn't right, but it's really hard for us to accept the fact that maybe your child, your spouse, a loved one, or even yourself could be suffering from an addiction. So what are some signs that we need to look for? Pills that maybe are in a medicine cabinet are disappearing. Somebody continuously has excuses for why they're losing their prescriptions. They, they will either say, I've lost the actual prescription or my prescription bottle that contained my medicine, I've lost that. Um, seeking prescriptions from more than one doctor, and this is what we call doctor shopping. And it's an attempt to get various prescription medications from different doctors. 
Warning signs may include taking higher dosage despite the warnings of taking higher amounts. You may see stealing, forging, or selling prescriptions um, for, for other people. A lot of times for adolescents, you're going to see changes in their friends. Spending less and less time at home with the family. Again, this can be adolescents, but many times it's also an adult. A lot of times for adults, they may still be at home, but they're isolating themselves from the rest of the family. Maybe they're spending time alone in the basement watching TV or they're up in a bedroom. They're not participating with the family anymore. We might see adolescents' grades slipping. People lose interest in things that they, they so often enjoyed before. And you're going to see a lot of various mood swings probably occurring. Another warning sign would be frequent trips to the emergency department with various complaints of pain. So treatment works. A lot of times people think treatment is this big scary secret. So what I want to do is just give you a quick overview of some of the things that are offered in, in various levels of care of treatment. And there are very many different levels of care. Intensive outpatient usually meets three times a week for a minimum of nine hours per week. Classes will include education classes, self-esteem building, and group therapy. Patients are also assigned an individual counselor to work with while they're in treatment. An extended outpatient program typically meets around two times a week for group therapy and an education class. Patients can also meet individually with a counselor in lieu of groups if that level of care meets their needs. Since everyone close to the person who's using is affected, couples and family therapy is highly encouraged. If a person is at risk for withdrawal from a substance, they may need to be hospitalized first to be detoxed. Residential treatment is where a person goes to stay at a facility to receive care. They are typically there from two weeks to 26 days roughly, depending on a variety of factors, including insurance. Many times people need to go to residential first if they've tried outpatient but have been unsuccessful in staying clean and sober. 12-step groups such as AA or NA are highly recommended in conjunction with treatment. As with treatment, people recover with others and they draw strength and support and hope from one another. Once a person completes treatment, they may also attend what's called aftercare or continued care. And this is often a group that meets once a week at no cost. And research shows that the longer somebody stage or somebody stays engaged in recovery-oriented programs, the better their chances are at maintaining their sobriety. Oftentimes, relapse is a part of recovery. However, developing a strong relapse prevention plan can lessen the chances of a relapse occurring. Sedlicek offers treatment services for adolescents as well as adults and families. The only service that Sedlicek does not provide is residential. Medical detox is done at the hospital. Medication-assisted treatment is now being utilized in many centers in combination with addiction treatment. And this is the use of medications that can help reduce cravings for the substance of choice. Some medications used can also prevent opioids from activating receptors in the brain. In closing, I would just like to say that it's important to remember that addiction is a family illness. Everyone is affected, not only the user, but all of those close to them as well. Secondly, just because it, it's a medication prescribed doesn't mean that you can abuse it without serious consequences. On the screen, you will see our contact information, and all calls are held in strict confidence. And thank you so much for joining me today, and I do hope that this has been informative.
Well, thank you very much, Sean. A lot of good information. Now, to remind our listeners, questions can be submitted from the box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And there'll be a spot um, listed as questions, and you can just type your question in. And just bear with us here a minute. We have one. Kind of have a problem accessing it. There we go. Well, while we're working on this question, oh, here we go. Uh, our first question is, can you offer any advice to a parent um, who suspects their child might be misusing a drug? One of the things that I would do is to call and get an assessment. That's the first step in the process. Um, it, this addiction will cause people to lie, and that's just the nature of the illness. So you ask your child, are you using any substances? They're going to tell you no. And many times parents, myself included, so desperately want to believe that they're not. And I always encourage parents, get a drug screen. You can have them test it. Call and get an appointment for an assessment. The assessment process consists of sitting down with a counselor. They talk to the person. They get a history. They talk to them about what's going on. Then as a collective team, meaning the family, the child, the, the counselor, then can decide what level of care probably is going to be the best fit for that person at that time. A follow-up question to that, um, what if the child just continues to dis deny use? Um, do you have any suggestions in dealing with that? Again, I think that the drug screens are going to be very important because the drug screens don't lie. Um, marijuana, for instance, is going to stay in someone's system, in, in, their, in their system for up to 30 days sometimes longer, depending on how often the person has been using. We have a question asking us to re-show the web page, and I've done that here for you. Uh, oops, I went the wrong way, excuse me. There we go. Uh, there was a question asking about um, the two websites that, um, that Sean shared. Now, the next question uh, is, is kind of similar to the one of the first one, but I just wanted to make sure, Sean, there wasn't anything else that you'd like to add. If you know someone who needs treatment, how do you get them help, and what type of help can Sedlicek offer to the loved one? Is there anything else you'd like to add? I think what I'd like to also add is the, the part of that question that addresses what is there to offer to my loved one. We have a wonderful family program at Sedlicek. And because I've said it is a family illness, it's like a puzzle piece. If we treat the person who is addicted and then put them back into the puzzle, be, being their family, and the family hasn't worked on any issues, those pieces don't fit together anymore. So our family program is critical for people who have someone in treatment because they come to learn, and it's also a wonderful support for them because they're suffering right along with the person who's addicted. A couple questions about the farming parties. I um, First one is, uh, you were talking about the farming parties, a question related to that. I heard recently from a co-worker that they had heard that it's called a, a Skittles party. And have you heard of that? It's basically the same thing. Um, it's funny because you, you think you have all these years of experience in this field as we do at Sedlicek, but we're learning new things every single day. And we learn these from our patients. And a lot of the things that we learn come from the adolescents. And I think it's critical for parents also to stay updated on all the new terms and all the new words that are being used about using, about these farming parties, about Skittle parties. Because if you're unaware of these terms, then you're not going to know what your child is talking about, especially when they're texting. You know, some of these things that they text to each other appear to be code words or haven't got a clue what they are. But if you know what it means, you're going to know what they're talking about. And a follow-up question to that, do farming parties really occur here in the Cedar Rapids area? Unfortunately, they do. Um, we, we've not heard, you know, a lot of it, but we do hear of it. If we ask our adolescent population, about these, they'll tell you, oh yeah, I've been to some of these, and yes, we, we definitely know what they are. 
Our next question is on an unrelated, or a, a, another topic here. Does insurance cover treatment either as inpatient or outpatient? It depends a lot on a person's um, plan that they have with their particular insurance company. More often times than not, an insurance company is more likely to pay for outpatient services rather than having to pay for some type of an inpatient stay because it's a lot more expensive. Most treatment can be done on an intensive outpatient level. Um, and again, it's going to depend a lot on what the person's um, insurance policy is, how many days that they are allowed per calendar year. Um, we have um, the ability to track that and help them to know where they're at in terms of what, how many days they've used while they're in treatment. Another question. I think my son may need medical detox. Who would I contact to start this process? Again, I think the first thing would be to set up an appointment for an assessment. Many times when a, I or another counselor meets with someone, um, I'm looking at more than just what questions am I asking and what responses am I getting. I'm, I'm doing a visual of the person. If somebody is using alcohol and we're afraid they might need medical detox, we're going to see someone who is very tremulous, um, they may be sweating, you know, depending also on the amount of alcohol that they have been using and for the length of time that they're using it is also going to be an indicator to me that I will say I really think it's important for them to get assessed. What happens at that point is I would make the recommendation for them to be assessed um, at the hospital and this is done with an access nurse who will medically assess the person to determine do they need to be in the hospital for several days, a day or two, receiving um, medication. And what that does, especially for alcohol, the medication that they get will prevent or help to, help to prevent a life-threatening seizure that does occur with alcohol withdrawal. I believe we have answered all the questions that have been submitted to us at this time, but I want to tell you about our next webinar topic is Skin Cancer, Reduce Your Risk with Dermatologist Robert Berry, MD. This webinar will be Thursday, May 17th from noon until 1, and then Dr. Berry will take questions after his live discussion. Now, a tape of Sean's program will be available at the website listed on your screen, mercycare.org forward slash live. And give us a couple days to get this um, added. And then you can always check back to this website for information about future webinars as well as listen to any of the past webinars. I don't believe I see any additional questions at this time, but again, if you do have questions for Sean, she can be reached at the number on your screen, 319-398-6226. Well, thank you all for joining us today.